our world and beyond. Space, in partnership with the European Space Agency. July the 20th, 1969, and a new page in the history books is being written. Apollo 11's lunar module, Eagle, was heading for the surface of the moon. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Well, it was the middle of the night, I, and I was um, sitting with my parents, and we had a tiny little black and white television screen. But it's very pretty out here. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? I was, as a six-year-old kid, glued to the television, television station, watching the reports from the lunar landing. Hey, you got it? That's a good step. Beautiful view. Is that something? We couldn't see anything at all, because the pictures were terrible, and we were sitting there going, is that his foot? No, that's the moon. No, that's the spacecraft. We couldn't see anything, but we knew it was important. I hope you're watching uh, how hard I have to hit this into the ground uh, to the tune of about five inches, Houston. We had a black and white television set in our living room, and it was a big excitement seeing this achievement. That's one small step for man. One for At Aberystwyth University in the west of Wales, there's a research department dedicated to the solar system. They can test robots here to judge their suitability for the exploration of the moon or Mars. And there's always discussion about how the Earth's only natural satellite came to be. What they brought back gave us a theory, which was that the Earth and the Moon formed with a giant impact. It made an awful lot of mess. For a while, the Earth would have had rings like Saturn. That ring recondensed to form the Moon we know now. And they made that theory in order to explain why the material they brought back looked like Earth material. Over the next 40 years, we've looked at that material more and more closely and realized that, in fact, it isn't the same material as the Earth. It must have come from the other impact of the Mars-like object. People sometimes call it Thea. And so that theory has completely been turned on its head since it was first formed. But it's still the best theory there is. Footprints here, close in. There are the conspiracy theorists who don't believe the Apollo missions care, ever put man on the moon. But the latest like probe, no Chandrayaan-1, has taken 3D images of an area photographed by Apollo 11, and the two like match perfectly. This is definitive proof that, yeah, they really went there. It's completely dead. There's no water, there's no life, nothing very much has happened for the last four billion years. There are no sharp edges. Everything has just slowly been ground down. The mountains have been ground down to make the dust that you see. It's the same stuff that was here when the Earth and the Moon formed together four billion years ago. It's a very, very old place. It's the oldest place you've ever been. And from this ancient rock, they brought back only a few stones. The six successful Apollo moonshots were a massive achievement from a technological, political and human point of view. But many scientists were left wanting more. The Apollo missions went to the places that were easy to get back from. Uh, the, the equator, the Earth side, the flat pits. If we went to the Earth and applied that principle, we would land on the Sahara Desert and we would bring back a third of a ton of sand. And if that was all we knew about the Earth, we would learn a tremendous amount from that third of a ton of sand. But we wouldn't know about mountains and all the other stuff. We need to sample the whole of the Moon. That means going to the far side of the Moon, it means going into the deep places in the Moon, it means going to the highlands of the Moon, going to the old bits. There are a few much younger bits going to those also. We need to understand the whole Moon, not just the very small areas that we went to. In December 1972, Apollo 17's Lunar Exploration Module Challenger took the last human adventurers to walk on the Moon's surface. Earth's near neighbor in space became somewhat neglected, almost forgotten. Lunar exploration began again in earnest in 2003 with the launch of the European Space Agency's probe SMART-1. Powered by a novel solar electric iron drive propulsion system, SMART-1 spent three years gathering vital data from lunar orbit before a planned crash into the Moon's surface.
It was a small satellite, not even 400 kilos, and yet it played a vital role in improving man's understanding of the moon. With Smart One, uh, the more scientific exploration of the moon as a, as a complete body started. It obtained again a more precise mapping of the lunar surface. It made a better measurement of the lunar gravity field. It had scientific instruments and it had remote sensing instruments uh, imaging the moon in the visible in the near-infrared and specifically also in X-rays. With these three methods together, that provides you the possibility for characterizing the material on the lunar surface. The Indian mission Chandrayaan-1 took lunar exploration a stage further. Launched at the end of 2008 with three ESA instruments on board, it took up an orbit specifically chosen for clear observation. Chandrayaan is the closest and the lowest remote sensing mission which has been flown to date. From the scientific data return of Chandrayaan, uh, we have the most accurate imaging and we have the most accurate information on surface features and surface material. Never seen the, sky so blue. the moon has always exerted a mysterious pull on the imagination, especially in those who witnessed man's first steps on the surface. And there are those in Aberystwyth who are dedicating their career to an exploration that began in July 1969. It just feels like it was such a shift in humanity. It, it, it's a new chapter. Um, and I think now going back to the moon is the next chapter. I think it's very important. There's little doubt that man will go back to the moon. It's just a question of when. Some talk of 10 years or so at most and there's no lack of enthusiasm. I mean, if you go back centuries, people have gone across the seas to go exploring. If you go back millennia, they'd have gone across the forest, and now we're setting sail to space. So that's the... Um... I have a picture of Earthrise over the moon, up on my bedroom wall, and you just look at that and think how incredible it is, and what an achievement it is that people went there. It looks fake. I had dinner with him once. The moon is fascinating scientifically because it's part of our own world and it tells us a lot about our own history. The next place you want to go is Mars because that's a different world that tells us how life gets started or not in different places. I think the main driver for going back to the moon is to exercise the technology of landing again uh, to establish um, building small bases and this is all in preparations for future Mars missions and for future humans on the surface of Mars. Moon is an excellent test bed for, do, for preparing for this next big step. It's 40 years since the world marveled at the achievements of the Americans Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, three names indelibly etched into history. But the next human footprints on the moon's surface are unlikely to come from a single country's drive for prestige, but more likely from cooperation between nations. At least, that's the hope. Hey, this is great. Talk, talk about being a space man. This is it. Thank <laughs> you.